Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Diplomat webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing an always fascinating topic, uh, Indian politics, particularly the state of the Indian National Congress and more broadly, the Indian opposition. The Congress party is going to be electing a new president on October 17th, and that means it's finally filling the top party post, which has been held on an interim basis by Sonia Gandhi since her son Rahul Gandhi resigned after Congress's disastrous showing in the 2019 general elections. Once the votes are counted, Congress will have a non-Gandhi at the helm for the first time in 25 years. Does that mean that the party can actually shake dynastic rule, which has been a longstanding concern? And in a broader sense, does it even matter? Um, Congress has had two consecutive shellackings in the national polls. Can new leadership help the party regain its strength and compete with the BJP? Or is the BJP going to retain its dominance? Today, we're going to be discussing the leadership election and more generally the future of Congress and the Indian political opposition writ large. And we're joined today by two very distinguished experts on Indian politics. We have Nistula Hebar, the political editor at The Hindu, and Parsa Venkateshwar Rao Jr., a freelance journalist based in Delhi. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Nisula, I'll have you start us off by giving it a general overview of the leadership race in Congress, um, the context behind it. What is the longer term leadership pro problem that the Congress is trying to solve? So the Congress is a bit like, uh, talking about the Congress is like an elastic bag. You can uh, stretch it as much as you want. It can go into uh, volumes of books, et cetera, or you could just uh, uh, sum it up in one sentence, uh, which for me as a political journalist is the most important, which is that uh, uh, there is a lack of electoral victories that is now uh, bugging the Congress. I'll just give you one small uh, um, piece of statistic, which was part of Gulam Nabi Azad, the senior Congress leader who quit uh, Congress recently and started his own uh, regional outfit in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, he basically said that in the in the last eight years, uh, out of the 49 elections, assembly elections, and the two general elections of 2014 and 2019, the Congress has lost 39 of these. So any leadership of any political party, in any democracy, as everybody knows, has to be validated, has to be legitimized through um, uh, uh, the, the power of that leadership to win elections, the, the, uh, the capacity of that leadership uh, to win elections and, of course, uh, through electoral victories, then uh, 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 kind of uh, implement your ideological project that you've been talking about to, uh, to your electorate. And the basic problem with Congress Party at this moment is, of course, that it's not been able to win elections. It's not been able to prove uh, a challenge to the BJP, which seems to be kind of running, uh, uh, running away with the race, especially when it comes directly when it faces the Congress Party. The only places where the BJP has actually uh, stuttered a bit is when it faces very strong regional parties. And that, of course, says a lot about the party system in India, but you know, that is not uh, what I want to talk about. So Congress Party is going to have an election uh, to elect uh, its party president. Uh, election is to be held on October 17th. And for the first time in many years, it's going to have a non Nehru Gandhi uh, uh, party president in the 137 year history of the Congress party, um, 50 years or so have seen Nehru Gandhi's at the helm. And as you just mentioned in your um, introduction, it's been 25 years since there's been a non Nehru Gandhi at the helm of affairs in the Congress. Of course, that has its own uh, uh, issues and that will have its own consequences with regard to the Congress party organization. Basically, what we need to kind of uh, in terms of framing this thing is going to be the 2014 election because I really don't want to go too far back uh, except to say that uh, uh, for many years uh, with Nehru Gandhi's uh, being the Congress high command there has been a successful erosion of regional uh, leaders within the party so that uh, the party is extremely centrally run it's a joke uh, in, in uh, political circles that every time a Congress legislature party meeting happens in any state uh, where they have to elect, say, a leader of that legislature party. The meeting just ends with a one-line resolution which says that we 
uh, uh, basically uh, empower the Congress president to decide who's going to be a, the chief minister or the leader of the opposition in that assembly. And no questions asked, whoever is decided by Delhi kind of remains that. Now, what has happened with these uh, successive defeats of the Congress uh, since 2014 is that some of that legitimacy has chipped away. So much so that there was a ginger group, uh, which after the uh, five, uh, especially after these five assembly elections, which got over this year, basically they stood up and said that, look, you need to kind of put all the organizational things in order. You can't have a party uh, which has been taken care of by a caretaker president. You need a party president with a vision who sort out our organizational issues, who will put out a program with which we can go to the uh, people to the electorate, become a, more uh, attracted to them so that they can come and vote for us. So there are all these very existential issues that are plaguing the Congress party at the moment. A lot of people say that two general elections should have been enough for any political party to get its act in order, at least uh, undertake some, some sort of reforms within, some sort of organizational, uh, 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 you know, sorting out, it should have taken place. There are reports that are hanging around. Uh, nobody has seen uh, uh, these uh, reports that were prepared after these electoral debacles. Uh, it also shows that the unspoken fact that the Congress party, the organization had with the Nehru Gandhi family, that the Nehru Gandhi families are the glue that holds the Congress organization together, that it is the, uh, the, the members of the family are not seen as a representing any faction within the Congress, be also being considered beyond uh, caste, community, and religion by the electorate of, of India. That has gotten eroded, and that has eroded the political authority of the Nehru Gandhi family within the Congress. So it brings us to a point where there is an internal churn, there is a demand for uh, uh, internal elections and organizational sorting out, but at the same time, uh, the Cong Congress party is not that eager also to let go of the, of the Gandhis because I think there is a lot of, uh, there is a feeling there that the Con Gandhis are not over yet and there is still some uh, worth to having the Nehru Gandhi family, if not uh, holding the position of party president, but at least uh, being around for the, uh, you know, just holding the party together, etc. cetera. Uh, Rahul Gandhi has made it very clear that he doesn't want to uh, be Congress president again. He was elected in 2017 and he quit after the 2019 debacle. He has basically decided that he's going to lead this Bharat Joro Yatra, which is a 3,750 kilometer uh, march, the long march from uh, Kanyakumari in the south of India to Kashmir, uh, and basically uh, do his bit in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, raising popular support for the ideas of the Congress party for his own political career, and also uh, get some organizational sort of um, effervescence going because it is a very somnolent sort of party organization. In many states, uh, you know, their district units are not organized. I mean, they're basically the organization of the Congress is uh, um, pretty much in a coma at the moment. So he has... Yes, now you are back with us. Okay, so um, I think the net connection here is a little unstable. I'm sorry, I don't know where I, uh, where you lost me, but uh, I think Rahul Gandhi is kind of uh, looking at a role where he is the power behind, he, you know, he has the power and the popularity, et cetera, but he doesn't have the responsibility of being Congress president. So uh, his mother seems to have realized that she wanted very much wanted him to be party president. So now they are hunted for a placeholder uh, the first candidate that they wanted as a placeholder was uh, Rajasthan Chief Minister Ashok Gehlot, who's a very sharp organizational man, and he really gave uh, the BJP a run for its money in the 2017 Gujarat election, where he was in charge of the polls. Uh, he basically said, no, I don't want to be, and he, wa he wants to remain Rajasthan Chief Minister. He doesn't want his rival to get that position. Um, what it says about the importance of being Congress president, of course, uh, is, is telling. Um, so now they've picked uh, uh, the, uh, the Gandhi's candidate for all intents and purposes is Mr. Malikarjun Karge, but to, of course, give the election, the feeling of being an election, that being the contest, Shashi Tharoor has also uh, filed his nomination papers. Strangely, a lot of the G23 ginger group who were speaking about reforms required within the Congress party 
who don't actually see very uh, who don't actually see eye to eye with Rahul Gandhi and his people within the Congress Party uh, gave their support to the Gandhi's candidate. They signed his nomination papers and you know as proposals, etc. So there seems to be some sort of a uh, uh, an arrangement that seems to have been arrived at. Uh, between Sonia Gandhi and the G23 group and the party organization. I don't know how many votes uh, Mr. Tharoor will get. He's certainly very popular uh, among young people in social media. And uh, we had this uh, situation where in Kerala, the senior, uh, if you look at the Facebook pages of the senior leaders of uh, uh, Kerala Congress, they were getting, you know, uh, breakbacks from the younger lot who said, why are you supporting an 80-year-old man to become party president? You know, you should support Charlie Tharoor from Kerala and young person um, has an, a, you know, a, a domestic and international outlook, has been uh, MP for three uh, consecutive terms in a tough seat like Thiruvannamapuram. So uh, all of this is happening. Uh, a lot of people say it, it's um, Mr. Kharge is a shoe in that he will be voted with a large uh, amount of vote. In fact, if you look at the previous uh, uh, what do you call it, history of uh, internal elections in the Congress, always the king's man has won or the queen's candidate has won. And uh, I don't see anything different happening, but I don't say that, I don't think that the fight would have been in vain. I have a feeling that Mr. Tharoor will, will gain in stature by having fought. Thank you very much, Ms. Dua. I know it's a, uh... As you said, you could write whole books on the, the Congress Party's leadership question. So I appreciate that very insightful uh, but brief summary. Um, Parsa, I'm going to give you another potential book link topic that I hope you can distill into a few minutes for us. Um, and that is something that Nistula referred to, the BJP's dominance at the polls. Um, can you speak a little bit as to why that has been happening? Um, is that due to the BJP's strength or Congress's weakness or a combination of the two? And will new leadership in Congress potentially change that situation? Uh, I think in a Hindu majority country, a party which comes in the name of Hindu politics has a natural advantage, but it took a very long time for this um, majoritarian politics to crystallize in the Indian situation. The Congress um, had dominated uh, from the time of independence, and even before that, for a very long time during the freedom struggle, uh, the Hindu parties, the, the Hindu organizations before the independence were small, like Hindu Mahasabha and other people, but they could not make much headway. Uh, the reason being the Congress was able to accommodate both the right-wing Hindus, the, uh, the poor people, and the, the minorities like the Muslims in an umbrella kind of an organization. But I think that had to break down sometime or the other. The Congress had a good um, uh, run for about 47 to 67 without any challenge. And they had another lease of life during the 70s and the 80s when they were able to still dominate uh, Indian politics. Uh, that's because the opposition parties could not uh, get their act together and uh, the Hindu party, that is uh, the BJP of the present day, which was uh, the Bharatiya Janasang after independence, could not uh, gather the numbers and could not uh, really assume its uh, leadership position. It needed a lot of time for that to happen. Uh, mainly because uh, the Hindu party, the Jansang, was uh, uh, rooted in the upper caste uh, Hindus, uh, which were uh, a minority. The upper caste Hindus did support uh, Jansang for a very, very long time, ever since its uh, inception in the 1950s. But uh, after 70s, what the, there is this... Uh, organization called Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh or the RSS, uh, which really um, marshals and gathers all the Hindu forces for the Hindu politics. Uh, it cannot be compared, uh, it can be compared only to the Zionists who make uh, use of uh, Jewish identity but not Jewish religion. So the RSS is, is an attempt to use 
the Hindu identity for political dominance without getting into Hindu religiosity. As Orthodox Jews don't accept the Zionists, similarly, many of the Orthodox Hindu sections do not accept the politics of the RSS. But after 1980s and 1990s, because of this uh, temple movement, everybody thinks that the temple movement is the real trigger of the Ayodhya temple, which was destroyed by the mob, uh, the Hindu mob in 1992, and after which it is believed that the BJP gained its um, uh, dominance in the Indian politics. But uh, what has happened, well, the basic uh, situation there is, in a Hindu majority country, it was but natural that there has to be a Hindu right-wing party somewhere on the political spectrum. Uh, uh, and the Congress could not contain that element in its uh, uh, coalition, rainbow coalition. It, it broke down. Uh, like the Hindu uh, uh, downtrodden classes, the Dalits, broke away from the Congress. The Muslims broke away from the Congress after the Babri Masjid uh, demolition in Ayodhya. The upper caste, for a while, played along with the Congress because the power structure was such that they enjoyed the power of being with the Congress. So when the BJP emerged as uh, a dominant party, it should not come, have come as a surprise. And I don't think there is any diabolical conspiracy behind it, though everybody thinks that uh, the temple issue is the one that really catapulted them uh, into the forefront. What has happened in the last uh, 50 years is uh, there has been an economic and social change in the, the Indian society. Uh, so when the uh, much of the society became uh, okay, and it, especially after the reforms of 1991, they became well off in, and the Indian middle class, and the Indian middle class meant the Hindu middle class became prosperous and assertive and successful. Uh, they naturally turned into uh, the Hindu right-wing politics or Hindu identity politics. I think that's the major reason for the dominance of uh, the BJP or the success of the BJP in the last uh, uh, two and a half decades. Even when they were not in power, they were uh, gaining ground and they became quite prominent in the Indian uh, political uh, discourse. Now, how long it will last, we do not know. But uh, it's important to understand the nature of the BJP. Uh, is it uh, a conservative party like the British Conservatives? Is it like the Republican Party in, uh, in the United States, uh, which is partly Christian, partly white, partly family values? Uh, the BJP and the RSS, which provides its ideological uh, ballast, they do not have any clear ideas. I do not think they speak very clearly about Hindu religion because there is no church-like thing for them to fall back on. Uh, the Republicans and the right-wing uh, uh, conservative politicians can always appeal to country, church, and family. Uh, for the BJP, there is no such uh, ready-made formula in Hinduism. So it uh, focuses or it emphasizes that the fact that the Hindus were dominated by either the British in the last 150 years and before that by the uh, uh, Muslim invaders and the Muslim rulers in the country. So that becomes the rallying point for the BJP. Uh, Anti-Muslim in the sense, anti-Muslim political domination. Anti-West because they think that the British dominated and sort of somewhere uh, suppressed the Hindu identity. Now, will they go back uh, to any orthodoxy? No, they are not orthodox in any way. Uh, uh, that is the irony of the whole situation, and I think it is true of uh, Iran also, where the Ayatollahs are, are orthodox and right-wing in one way, but they have not rejected modernism, science, nationalism, and militarism in any way. So the BJP talks about nationalism, talks about militarism, because that is their rallying point. How far will they succeed in a world where India is still not strong enough, but they do believe that India is becoming a uh, forced to reckon with, but it is not yet a reality. Uh, in a situation where uh, there is no single dominant power, like in the Cold War between Russia and America, uh, that situation has uh, completely uh, disappeared. But India has not emerged among the top powers as such, though the Indians, Indian middle class, Indian Hindu middle class wants to believe 
that they have at last arrived on the world stage and that they have much to contribute and they can influence uh, the global uh, situation or the global trends. But it is still, they are not there yet. They may reach there sometimes, but we are not very sure. Like China also believes uh, that they have arrived on the world stage and that they are ready to dominate. But is uh, China really ready to dominate and influence global politics? It's still not very clear. So India is far behind China and the Indian uh, right-wing party, uh, that is the BJP, the, or the Hindu identity or the Hindu politicians of India want to believe that they have arrived and it is India's hour. And for them, India's hour means the Hindus say, having a say in world politics after a very, very long time. But if you look back at history, uh, Indians uh, never played a great role uh, outside of India. Uh, you have to really dig into history and say they went to Southeast Asia, or they had their political influence, but uh, it was never the case. Uh, India and China have been self-contained uh, uh, entities for various reasons. So they now want to use nationalism as a card and their economic strength and increasing military strength as a bargaining counter to say that we can dictate uh, terms or we can influence or shape global politics. But that has not yet arrived. So somewhere when this dream fails, that the dominance uh, uh, dream fails of India and Hindus becoming a force to reckon with, then I think by that time, the BJP would have run its course of dominance. So uh, uh, the Congress had about 30 years to dominate, and I think the BJP will have another 10, 20 years to dominate, and then they will uh, peter away because uh, the a new paradigm which they wanted to establish is not going to last. Thank you, Parsa. A lot of food for thought there about uh, the deeper causes of the BJP's ascension, as you said, more complicated than just the Babri mosque. Um, I, I'm happy to welcome our third panelist, uh, Gilles Vernier, an assistant professor of political science at Ashoka University and the co-director of the Trivedi Center for Political Data. So, uh, Jill, I would like to ask you to give us a state of the uh, broader Indian opposition, which, as Nistula touched on in her remarks, we're not only talking about the Congress. In some ways, the biggest stretch the BJP dominance has been the smaller regional parties. So what can you tell us about the outlook for the opposition writ large? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so if you look at, you know, the overall performance of regional parties in, in recent elections, um, unlike Congress, most of them actually have not um, particularly declined. And we are in a situation in India where uh, there has been a decoupling of uh, electoral behavior between state and national elections. And if the BJP is uh, ultra dominant in the national stage, uh, many states uh, remain competitive. And in most of these states, uh, it's regional parties that are uh, giving a challenge to um, the BJP. Uh, for the past you know, 20 years, uh, the sum total of votes uh, garnered by uh, regional parties has always been higher than the sum of votes gathered by you know, Congress and BJP. Um, they have lost a bit of vote share in, 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 in 2019 as the BJP has succeeded to make strides in, in states where Congress used to be the main opposition. The BJP has succeeded in becoming the main opposition parties uh, in states where Congress used to have that role uh, and now confronted more against regional parties. But if you look at the geography of regional parties' performance, uh, there are strong variations because Across the north, in, across northern India, for instance, you still have a lot of regional parties that remain uh, quite quite powerful, but not quite as strong or quite not strong enough to uh, defeat the BJP in, in a head-to-head -head, um, election. So, uh, in, in 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 UP, for instance, uh, BSP and SP have tried various combination, various you know forms of alliances. They have. Uh, there has been a bipolarization of the party system in 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 in, in UP uh, with uh, a very strong performance of the Samadwadi party in in the last um, UP election, but the BJP retains a strong advantage uh, because contrary to regional parties, which historically in northern India have risen on the back of um, the uh, lower caste movement, 
the BJP has the ability to mobilize voters on uh, many issues at the same time, right? And 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 the, and 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 these issues have been mentioned already by 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 Nistula and by uh, Parsa uh, on nationalism, on um, ethnic majoritarianism, on development, on welfare, on um, strongman politics, uh, leadership, charisma, etc. Right. So they combine a lot of advantage advantages and so uh you can really sort regional parties into two broad categories um parties that uh, used to um, mobilize specific segments of the electorate usually based uh, on on caste or, or community lines uh, and parties uh, that we usually call regionalist parties that uh, seek to represent and defend uh, a particular idea of, 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 a, of a more encompassing regional identity, which is usually grounded uh, not in religion or caste, but in language. And if you look at the parties that still succeed to defeat the BJP today in one-to-one in -one elections, these are precisely these parties that incarnate a regional identity uh, and that have the ability of mobilizing and getting votes across uh, social categories within their states. So obviously that's a lot of parties in, in Southern India, um, the TDP, uh, sorry, the um, uh, sorry, in, in Andhra Pradesh, in, in Tamil Nadu, uh, it's this, the case also in Orissa, it is also the case in, in West Bengal. You cannot call these parties uh, parties of you know particular segments uh, of the population of their uh, states. More importantly, these are parties that offer a counter narrative uh, against the BJP's nationalist narrative that is actually effective, that uh, there is a need to protect uh, regional autonomy, there's a need to protect uh, regional identity, there's a need to protect uh, regional languages. I remember in the last um, election, state elections in Tamil Nadu, uh, the DMK presented uh, the election as, you know, the stake of the election as being, you know, civilizational. It was really to protect, you know, the, 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 the cultural particularism uh, and the heritage of, of Tamil Nadu against the political party, which was more or less presented as, you know, some form of northern invader uh, or, uh, or uh, as, 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 an, uh, as, as an outsider. So these are the parties uh, that have the ability of mobilizing successfully against uh, the BJP because their mobilization also is you know, based on strong regional identity and strong regional sentiment. And so in contrast, political parties that used to rise uh, on the back of mobilizing specific segments of the electorate, think about the BSP or the SP or the RJD uh, in, in, in Bihar, um, for example, have had much more, much greater difficulties in um, expanding their boundaries. Right. Even with uh, a good performance in the last UP election, uh, the SP's vote remain concentrated in its traditional basis. Uh, the BSP is a case in point because the Bahujan Samaj party, which used to uh, govern, uh, which used to win majority uh, which, which, um, in, in UP uh, not, um, in, in, in back in 2007, now has been reduced to uh, almost no representative. They have actually lost the only uh, MLA that uh, was elected uh, in, in 2022 in, in, in UP. And the reason for that decline is their inability to uh, go beyond the model of politics that helped them rise in the first place, uh, focusing on a core support group, on the mobilization of a core support uh, group among the electorate, and try to make up for the missing votes by uh, inducting um, strong individual candidate, which is usually an euphemism for you know rich and, and criminalized candidate, um, in order to um, gather the votes necessary to win uh, to win seats. The BSP today uh, continues to get the support of a majority of uh, Jatav Dalits, not Dalits uh, at, at large, but it has lost the ability of. Uh, 
getting votes practically from any other um, any uh, any other groups and so just like you know for the congress these parties are um, in need of um, reinvention and all of them are sort of interesting test cases of how difficult uh, it is to be. The Samajwadi Party is interesting because ever since um, Akhilesh took over um, in, in after 2012, uh, he has attempted very hard to, to do a makeover of the image of the party. He's tried to incarnate a form of leadership that's more encompassing. Uh, than, than, than in the past, if they, if they sort of try to clean up their act uh, in the way they choose um, candidate and, and, and so forth. But we see that the resistance is, remain very strong from, from within the organization because these parties basically tie themselves with uh, uh, politicians who um, got into politics uh, on the back of their own local strength, but also animated by their own sense of you know, self-interest it's very difficult to uh, make them, you know, change or have them, you know, transform the way they usually do, uh, they usually do uh, politics. And so despite, you know, best effort and intentions, Akhilesh has not been able, for instance, to totally revamp, you know, his organization the way uh, he would have wished because he has to face sort of the conservative of, you know, regional parties organizations. And so that's the overall situation. Now in terms of um, regional alliances or uh, opposition alliances, um, in the past, it's the only thing that has ever succeeded to defeat the dominant party. Of course, in, in, in 1970, from 1977, 1977 uh, in national elections um, onwards, there's a lot of street background. Thank you. And so, um, where was I? Yeah, so there is, so regional parties alliances uh, is basically the only thing that has ever succeeded to, you know, defeat dominant national parties uh, in, in, in national elections. Uh, but here, precisely because of this um, distinction between uh, northern regional parties and, and southern regionalist parties or eastern India's regionalist parties, uh, it's not very clear that, you know, putting numbers uh, together alone would be sufficient to... Um, to uh, to successfully challenge the BJP, uh, the opposition is not only fragmented; uh, it's also geographically scattered. And so, it's not just a matter of adding the strength of regional parties from the regions where, uh, from their particular region of strength or inscription, but um, it's the ability to create a movement that mobilizes voters uh, across the territory and, and in a way lifts everyone's boats you know, at the same time. But uh, even if most major regional parties and perhaps Congress you know, succeeded to find a formula how to, you know, to get together, it's not very clear how they could really help one another in the states where they have to deal with uh, the BJP um, face to face. So consider, for example, that uh, the, the heart of the strength of the BJP is its ability to defeat Congress candidates. Uh, there are about 190 seats uh, where Congress and BJP are face to face. And we know that the BJP in 2014 wins nine times out of 10. And so as long as you don't change that equation, the BJP's dominance in much of the Hindi belt, you know, remains, you know, fairly secure. And so even if Congress and all regional parties were to get together, it's not very clear what uh, the what um, uh, Jagan Reddy or the DMK or Mamta Banerjee uh, could do to help Congress in those seats where it has to uh, contest um, um, the the BJP um, alone, um, and then of course this what we call that third space of politics uh, in 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 India, uh, composed of many different regional and regionalist parties, has never really had historically the ability of really coming together. Uh, there have been in the past attempts at creating third front government. They never really lasted long. They always depended on the external support of Congress. 
um, they are divided uh, ideologically speaking. They are uh, all animated, obviously, by uh, their own self um, interest, um, and, uh, and 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 the prospect of uh, building alliance with a strong national party in power at the center remains also. Uh, a strong impediment to 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 create um, to create uh, uh, strong regional alliances. So there is a scenario in which uh, the BJP wins the next elections but loses its majority. It's always useful to remember that the BJP does not have a wide majority in 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 the Lok Sabha. So it's 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 uh, so we can imagine that you know the BJP loses their single majority, but then they would start um, courting you know various regional parties to you know reform uh, the NDA a little bit more as you know it used to it used to be before, and and. And, and and that will uh, in all likelihood uh, it's a strong option for regional parties that probably prevents them from um, coming together very effectively and very solidly um, at the um, at the uh, at the outset. So in a nutshell, um, it's useful to look at you know the trajectories and the different types of regional parties that we have. Um, to look at you know the formula that helps uh, some of them succeed in individual fights against the BJP versus those who uh, actually have been on on the decline or have not been able to uh, mobilize across um, social categories of um, voters, and then there's the national stage where. Uh, um, the political landscape remains um, intensely, uh, intensely um, fragmented, and 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 that's always been historically uh, to the advantage of the dominant party, um, which today, of course, is the BJP. Thank you very much, Jim, uh, for that comprehensive overview of India's opposition, um, particularly the regional parties, which we hadn't touched on before. Uh, we're going to take it over to our audience Q&A now. And our first question gets us back uh, to where we really started out, which is talking about the dynastic nature of Indian politics, uh, in particular, the Gandhi's uh, grip on the INC. Is this seemingly widespread expectation driven top down by political leadership elites, or is this coming from the bottom up from the electorate? Um, and I think this really touches on a question that Nusula mentioned briefly in her comments. Um, can the Congress exist without the Gandhis holding it together? So maybe uh, Nusula, we can start with you and then uh, Parsa and Jid, you can chime in as you are. Well, I don't know about Parsa and uh, Professor Vanier, the political scientists, and so, but I'm, I'm an anthropologist by uh, education and sociologists. So I basically look at the nature of power and authority. And nature of power and authority is always mixed. You know, it's not a very, uh, uh, it's not, in a, it doesn't exist in a silo. A leader becomes a leader because of various things. You have a traditional, you have authority which is born out of your traditional space in society. You're born into the elite or the leadership community. Or, uh, you know, you have, um, uh, acquire it through merit, or you could be just this charismatic person. People like you and they want to vote you back. So the Nehru Gandhi family for many years, and I'm going back to from Motila Nehru's time to uh, Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi, they, they have presented, and even Priyanka uh, Vadra to a certain extent, they have presented a very good mixture of this amalgamation of all kinds of uh, traditional and um, uh, rational as well as uh, uh, charismatic authority. And that worked with the Indian electorate uh, for a while. And actually the problem that the Gandhi's, the Nehru Gandhi family is facing at the moment arises out of this very, very um, uh, indefinable something that they had shared with the Indian public and their current inability to convince the public of their programs and ideology and their, their pro of their parties is, uh, ideology and of their own uh, ability to lead, uh, of their ability to speak to the electorate. And actually that is a problem that is happening. So I don't think it either comes from uh, the elite or uh, whatnot in a, in a democracy. It largely comes from winning elections. And when you win elections, then everybody, all other uh, communities which are not directly involved also 
they try to be on your right side. So then that validates more and more validates your leadership. So uh, the question I don't think is whether there has been a demand from the bottom or the top or whatever. They provide a certain function, the Nehru Gandhi family or a dynasty in any political party. They provide a certain function of asserting authority in a field where loyalty uh, always trumps merit. Uh, where an appeal uh, uh, to the people is indefinable. It is, you can't really uh, check all the boxes and say, okay, now I have got all these things and I should win elections. You can in fact even look at it in terms of Prime Minister Modi. He doesn't come from a dynastic sort of politically important family, but he did go up, go up the ranks from uh, the RSS and he has charisma of his own and he has the governance experience. So all of that, Plus his own uh, primordial identity of being from, uh, you know, he's, I think, only the second Indian prime minister who belongs to a backward community minister, David Gauda was the first. So all of this coalesces is to legitimize certain, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and popularize a certain uh, style of leadership. So as long as the people want to, uh, it works. And when it doesn't, then you can blame all sorts of things. What dynasty does actually, um, and that is, uh, it is fatal to party organizations in terms of internal democracy, etc. So you then create an oligarchy, and then that ossifies a party organization. So the question is not of leadership or whether you can win like you whatever. At some point of time, it, it is going to hurt you. There has to be uh, a circulation, and there has to be a feeling within the party organization and the people who are investing with you that we do also, we also have a, a shot of going up. Or it's not, it's not sure that if I vacate my seat, my son should get it or my daughter should get it. So uh, there has been a change in the last few years in terms of uh, uh, questions being asked uh, uh, of dynastic parties. Uh, the third thing that happens with dynastic parties and they, how they ossify is also uh, 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 this uh, rent-seeking behavior, all the rent-seeking and the um, networks of patronage that they have extended. At some point, new newcomers want to get in on the action, and uh, uh, distribution of resources has to be done anew. And uh, it depends on whether the particular dynasty at the top can uh, 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 do a uh, 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 um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, revolve uh, or do a circulation of that elite and still managed to remain on top. I would like to give the example of George V. And this is, uh, I think, in the midst of the First World War, or just after the second, uh, there was some sort of a bill that had to be passed. And he was asked by the prime minister that you need to create more uh, peers because the such certain bill, I think the Irish bill, was not getting past the House of Lords. He gave his word, but the bill got passed on its own. But he, he gave his word because, and after the First World War, the British royal family very clearly disengaged itself from the from uh, the nobility and and became a kind of a uni unified uh, symbol of the of the state and uh, that is what dynasties need to do you can't keep creating oligarchies below you and have an ossified seat All right, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to another question. Uh, this is about the remarkable public response to the Baracho do Yacha, uh, the long march that Rahul Gandhi is currently leading. Uh, what impact is this likely to have on Congress's political fortunes, particularly coming as closely as it is to the new leadership election? Um, Parsa, maybe we can start with you on this. Oh, we have you muted. All right, you can go I'm ahead. sorry, you have to repeat the question. I'm not um, getting the, yeah, the audio. How, how do you view the response to the march that Rahul Gandhi is, is currently leading across India? And does this actually signal anything about the long-term electoral future of the Congress? You know, uh, the Yatra at this moment is passing through a large part of uh, South India. Uh, in South India, the Nehru Gandhis have a, a personal uh, charisma, which uh, people like them at, at a personal level, not because they are Congress. Uh, it's not that way. 
or they believe in liberal politics they like the family the family has a certain mystique and charm for them though it is uh, at a very reduced uh, level because both in kerala and tamil nadu uh, the congress has no uh, electoral base has no political base but uh, the gandhis nehru gandhis are liked quite a bit in both the states in karnataka the congress has got a, a fighting chances it is a force to reckon with and uh, it does not have much to do with uh, the nehru gandhis as such the two other uh, southern states telangana and andhra the newly formed states newly formed in 2014 uh, there was a time when uh, the congress was very strong in, in that state but it has lost out to the regional players but the family still retains uh, a certain charm for the people but they may not vote for them you know the question now is everybody is looking can rahul gandhi revive the congress in the sense can they win the elections in 2024 uh, can they win the elections 2024 to retrieve part of the ground they have lost one second are they in a position to uh, form the next government with the help of the other regional parties opposition parties uh, at the moment it doesn't look like the yatra is uh, going to help them in any way uh, at that level you know at the electoral level because the real test would be when rahul gandhi passes through the hindi heartland to what extent people will flock to him to what extent they will uh, respond to him because he is still speaking the old um, liberal language of inclusivity inclusivity and uh, uh, caring for the people and a more human uh, politics uh, the country especially in the india heartland has become very militant uh, very intolerant so they don't want this uh, they would think that this liberal namby pamby liberalism is not for them so i don't think they are uh, willing to listen or they are receptive to the kind of message that rahul gandhi wants to convey but one must uh, give one uh, issue one has to concede that rahul gandhi might not be your regular successful politician but he is showing a dint of idealism which is lacking all over the country uh, it might be impractical it may not win him the votes or the brownie points but he is sticking to a certain ideological ground which is more idealistic i think that we have to uh, uh, give him the credit for thank you parsa uh, i would I'd like to finish by asking you uh, you talked a little bit about what regional parties would need to do uh, to expand their support what does congress need to do uh, which segments of the electorate that's currently voting for the bjp do you think maybe congress could win or win back and how would they actually go about doing that um if you look at the electoral base of the congress one way to characterize it is that it's no one in particular right uh, so they get a little bit of votes but across a lot of groups that used to be of course you know a, a source of strength not being associated with a specific segment of the um, electorate uh, but it's also you know the sign that uh, the congress doesn't have you know that ability to um, you know retain or build a, a core support group you know from anywhere and so the congress is sort of condemned to have to uh, mobilize uh, across all those sections um, at the same time and on the one hand it could be an advantage because it gives an opportunity for the congress to uh, mobilize on you know ideas that matter on um, on ideas that are you know common you know across um, uh, segments of um, voters uh but it's very difficult to do that when uh in front of you you have a party who is also less and less you know the, the 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 party of a specific segment of the electorate so today upper caste for instance vote absolutely massively cohesively uh for uh the bjp and the bjp has succeeded in diversifying and consolidating support from almost every other group 
with the exception of a few groups still aligned with regional parties like Yadavs and of course uh, and of course minorities. And so uh, it's very difficult for the Congress to um, to resist and, and to you know build um, a, an alternative um, in front um, in front um, of that. The problem of the Congress and is still a pointed to that you know uh, very effectively is that the decline is not circumstantial it's structural if you look at the decline of the congress they peaked in terms of voucher in 1984 in part in special in special circumstances after the death of you know indira gandhi and after that they've perpetually declined there are only two elections in 99 and 2009 where they have actually gained vote share compared to the previous election otherwise they've been losing ground every time since uh since since 1984 and so it's not very clear that you know you can change that trajectory uh merely by projecting uh, uh you know a new form of you know a leadership or by um agitating sort of you know or, or by you know using you know symbolic gestures um, in order to do that the heart of a party strength lies in its organization and its ground organization is to also mention that and uh and this is where the congress uh lacks um the most and so um I mean, there's really no one formula for the Congress to follow, you know, to 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 revive, right? Uh, but uh, without concentrating, you know, resources, efforts, and time on actually build organization on the ground that lasts, um, anything that they do is unlikely to produce uh, a lot of results, uh, electorally uh, speaking. And in many ways, the Yatra is a symbol of that because, you know, it's by definition uh, something that is temporary, something that is transient. It goes into some place, it gathers some, you know, goodwill and, and, and support. People come, they're curious, or, or they even cheer, you know, Rahul Gandhi or uh, the walkers. Uh, but the next day, the Yatra moves on to another place, and 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 there's nothing or not much, you know, tangible that is left behind to actually sustain that effort and and convert that eventually in in electoral gain um, later. So you do not see the Yatra has a, 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 you know a, a recruitment exercise of local cadre, which would remain you know on the ground to continue to do the work. I don't see them. I mean, we don't see them you know doing that, for example. And so uh, there's no there's no substitute for you know hard work and and in organizational building in organization building. And the stark reality today is that. Congress simply does not have the people and the resources to do that, because the decline of the Congress has not just been, of course, a decline in terms of support and vote share, but it's been an organizational decline, which is even, you know, older than the decline in, in, in electoral performance. And uh, over the past few years, the Congress has been bleeding uh MLAs and MPs and cadres and party workers and and major political figures who also have left who join other parties um and when these people leave they take whatever little organizational capacity they had they take that away with them um and so there there's really no um there's no kind of symbolic gesture that you know could um that could that could substitute or that could sort of counter uh the, the the impact of of that kind of erosion from the ground that the party is suffering from thank you so these issues are a lot more deep-seated than just the question of who sits on top of the congress party at the moment so with that in mind uh, what are the prospects for assuming that Karge is tapped as the leader for him to actually turn around Congress's fortunes. Um, as we've mentioned, he's older. Uh, you know, he's still got the stamp of approval from the Gandhis. Um, how much of a difference is this election really going to make in the future of the Congress? And I'll, I'll let our panelists volunteer who wants to tackle this question. <laughs> Mistula? 
And in my view, all that this election is going to do is actually just get one thing off the table. Because uh, for the last three years, Congress has had an interim president. So now they'll have a full-time president with the backing of um, the most powerful family within that system, the most powerful individuals within that system. And uh, uh, hopefully it'll carry some weight. But what I saw uh, on what everybody else saw happening in Rajasthan with that revolt of MLAs, despite the high command having decided that things are going to go a certain way, um, uh, it's going to be a very different sort of a world uh, that this new Congress president will have to uh, face and uh, nothing can, as Jesus, Professor Bernia said, that, that nothing that can uh, replace work on the ground. How much can he inspire, and uh, uh, how much can the remote control working actually have an impact on a party organization that's already pretty comical and somber? That that is something that. Congress party will have to face. There's some, they're going to come, they're coming out with something new. And uh, as they did when the UPA first came to power with the prime minister, uh, uh, you know, be, being selected by the Congress president, by the UPA chairperson and being put in place, that uh, dual power centers, et cetera. Uh, I don't know how well that's going to work in a political party. Uh, I have seen, actually, my uh, domain knowledge has been mostly in covering the BJP. And I have covered them from the day they sat in the uh, opposition in 2004 uh, till date, which is 18 years. And I saw how that party imploded from within in their own leadership uh, uh, fight, despite the fact that there was uh, their ideological mothership, RSS, was there to guide a lot of the processes and try and kind of handle things for them and try and handle that it doesn't, uh, the party doesn't spatter all over the uh, uh, sidewalk. Uh, but these are uh, bloody battles. I'm yet to see one in uh, in the Congress. I just saw a little bit in Rajasthan. I have a very old-fashioned notion about leadership and uh, uh, party politics, etc. If you need a person who wants to be there, who has a vision, and who has the strength to, uh, you know, uh, implement that vision. After all, you know, even BJP got to the point where it has because they, everybody just got together and said, okay, Modi's our man. He's going to get us through, and that's back him. And he wanted that job, and he worked very hard to get it. So I'm still waiting for somebody like that to emerge from the Congress. And uh, without that sense of purpose, uh, I find uh, uh, I don't think Mr. Khadija is going to be able to make a huge mark. Thank you, Mr. La. Uh Parsa or Jiltu, either of you want to chime in with some closing remarks on this topic? Uh, does the new leader of the Congress really matter, given the issues that we've discussed throughout this, this discussion? Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I'm very glad to have had the chance to listen to these thoughts um, of our distinguished experts on Indian politics. And I hope to see everyone at a future Diplomat webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon.